We talked about how dark matter explains uh, the growth of the structure. And then we also talked about the things that can't be dark matter. We talked about massive objects like black holes, planets. We talked about how modifications of gravity don't work. And we talked about how known particles like neutrinos or protons and electrons don't explain the dark matter. So what is the dark matter? What's the particle responsible for it? And remember the three characteristics that any dark matter particle has to have. It has to be dark. Okay. It doesn't interact with light. It has to be stable because the particle existed in the early universe and it still exists today at about the same number density. And it has to be cold, which I mean, which means that the particle has to be moving slowly enough that it's, so it can fall into potential wells and form the structure we see today. If everything's moving at the speed of light, nothing can collapse. You don't get structure in the universe. You don't get galaxies. You don't get stars. You don't get planets. So with an eye towards finding this sort of particle, let's look at the standard model of physics which explains almost everything we know about physics and has since the 1970s, right? And we'll look for where we might add something into the standard model in a reasonable, natural way and uh, produce a particle that's a good candidate for dark matter. So here are all the particles that we know that make up our universe today, right? There are the quarks on top uh, that form the protons and neutrons that, that, that we uh, that we see, there are leptons, such as the electron. These are the three, uh, the up quark and down quark make protons and neutrons. The electron is the electron, and that, that forms basically every particle that you commonly interact with. But there's lots of other ones. There are heavier particles. There are three generations here of quarks, right? This first generation is second generation with a charmed and strange quark, and a heavier top and bottom quark uh, in the third generation. Uh, leptons also have three generations, the electron, the muon, and the tau lepton. These heavier generations all decay very quickly to the lighter generations that have less mass. And so you don't, these, these aren't part of our common experience, but they are particles that you can produce either at the early universe where there's a lot of energy around, or you know, in colliders or something today where you can form energy. On top of those, uh, those particles, uh, these fermions, there are the gauge bosons. And the gauge bosons uh, control the forces that interact between particles. They, they, they tell us how the electron, say, interacts with the quarks um, and how the quarks interact with each other. There's the gluon on top, and that mediates what we'll call the strong interaction. Uh, actually, I think I'll go through these in a slide again. The photon, which of course is responsible for the electromagnetic interaction, and the Z and W bosons responsible for the weak force. I think that's actually also our next slide. Oh, okay. The rules of quantum theory that, that pertain to all these particles that we know says that every particle interaction has to conserve certain properties. There are certain properties that are the same before the particle interaction and after the particle interaction every time. Some of those is charge. I can't have a particle interaction that starts with charge and ends up with less charge or more charge. It has to stay the same. Spin. These particles all have some sort of intrinsic angular momentum. Um, and the amount of angular momentum at the beginning of my interaction has to be the same as the end. So um, say electrons have uh, spin one half. So if I start with one electron, I have to end with something that has spin one half at the end too. Uh, energy is conserved in every particle interaction. So the total mass plus kinetic energy that I start with is the total energy that I get out. Um, some numbers are conserved. The number of leptons in every interaction are conserved. Uh, and also the number of um, electrons, the number of muons plus muon neutrinos, and taus plus tau neutrinos is conserved. And also the number of baryons in every interaction is conserved. Uh, finally, uh, color uh, stays conserved, and it stays zero, which I'll talk about in just a second. Everything stays colorless. The rules of quantum field theory then say if I conserve those, right, and I have an interaction that conserves those, it will happen. Every interaction that can happen will happen. That's a fundamental part of our quantum field theory. It might be very rare. There are four fundamental forces. Um, like I just said two slides ago before I remember I had this slide. Uh, there's the gluon, which controls the strong nuclear force, and it keeps quarks confined in uh, protons and neutrons. Sorry, that's a question. Um, there is the photon, which controls the electromagnetic force, the one you're most familiar with. Uh, the, the Z and W bosons control the weak force interactions, um, and gravity isn't in the standard model. It seems important, we're standing on a planet, uh, but it's not here. And, and in parentheses here, I've put in the, the relative strength of all of these forces. I've just assigned the strong force to be one, and everything else is smaller. 
The electromagnetic force is one one thousandth as strong as the Strong force. The, uh, the weak force uh, is weaker. It's 10 to the minus 16 times as strong as the strong force, 10 to the minus 13 times as strong as the electromagnetic force. Uh, so, you know, a trillionth of strong. And gravity is a trillionth, 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 millionth as strong as the, as the uh, strong nuclear force, 10 to the minus 41-ish. Okay. <laughs> then there's also the Higgs boson you might have heard about, and that uh, assists in gravity in some way. It helps explain why particles have different masses. But it is not a mediator force that, you know, basically communicates between particles that there is mass and you should have gravitational interaction. So there, in the standard model, there is no such gravitational particle. And there are lots of uh, fundamental particles. There's not just those up and down quarks. There's these heavier cousins, charm, strange, top and bottom quarks. Um, and most of them are stable. So in the proton, we have two up quarks and a down quark. <coughs> up quarks have a uh, charge of plus two thirds. A down quark has a charge of minus one third, plus down because it's negative. So the proton has a charge plus one, plus two thirds, plus two thirds, minus a third. A neutron has two down quarks and an up quark. It, uh, two down quarks are both minus one third charge. So the up quark is plus two thirds charge. Total charge zero, neutral. You can also form things like a, a heavier proton cousin of just three strange quarks together, uh, right? Uh, but these things decay very rapidly. They're not stable particle configurations. This is the omega particle. It decays in 8 times 10 to the minus 11 seconds, so about a trillionth of a second. There are also antiparticles. So for every sort of quark, every sort of lepton, there's an antiparticle that has the same mass, but it has opposite charge and spin. So just as I have a proton, which has an up quark, an up quark, and a down quark, I have an anti-proton. An anti-up quark, uh, yes? Is there any reason that the anti-particle couldn't figure out dark matter? Um, so it, remember that dark matter, it can't be the anti-particle of something like a proton. So if an anti-proton is dark matter, it still has a charge, the opposite charge, so it's negative one instead of one. But it does interact with light. So, so it, it won't be our dark matter, but that's a, that's a good idea. Um, and people have searched for, for antimatter sort of things in, in our universe uh, for these sorts of reasons. Um, right. So if you can see, since these all have uh, this opposite charge, a proton has charge plus one, plus two thirds, plus two thirds, minus one third, and an antiproton has charge minus one, minus two thirds, minus two thirds, plus one third. Um, this was first predicted in the case of positrons, which are anti-electrons. They got their own special name, unlike every other particle, by uh, Paul Dirac in 1932. Quarks have three, uh, there are three types of quarks, and we call these things color uh, because, uh, I don't know, we did. Uh, you know, the, nothing at a quark size has any, any color or anything else, but we had to give it a name. And we call these three things colored, and we call them red, blue, and green. And it's a, it's a fundamental postulate of the strong interaction that everything that we see in nature is colorless. And it's colorless in one of two ways. Uh, for the baryon, something like a proton uh, here, I have two up quarks and a down quark. One is blue, one is red, and one is green. And those combine like light does to make white light, so it's colorless. Right? This is, this is why this color thing works. You can also have mesons, uh, like the pion, which we'll talk about later. This has an up quark and an anti-down quark. And just like you can have color, you can have anti-color. So this is red, anti-red, or blue, anti-blue, or green, anti-green. And so it's also colorless for the same reason. These are the stable particles. Um, you can never observe, and this is kind of an important fact, you can't observe a single up quark uh, anywhere in nature. Uh, so you can't observe something with color, you can't observe a free up quark. You can only see these particles in these sorts of configurations either the mesons where it's two quarks colorless because one is a color and one is it's anti-color, or the baryons, and I just put like an incomplete list of baryons here. Uh, you know, all these configurations of three different types of six quarks can exist, um, and they're all uh, uh, colorless because they all have red, green, and blue parts. Um, what, what's found as part of the strong nuclear force um, is, is different forces like gravity, right? The gravity from Earth gets really weak you're very far, far away from the Earth. It's not pulling very hard. 
Same with electromagnetism, right? If you're really far away from a magnet, you don't feel much force. The strong force actually acts the opposite to way. The farther two quarks of different color get from each other, the stronger the force between them is. Um, yes, in the back. I'm, I'm puzzled by it is impossible to observe something with color in nature. Why? So it's because of the, the I think what I'm just getting to is this, this asymptotic Could force. Could you repeat so, questions, please? What? Could you repeat Oh, yeah, questions? sorry. She, she asked, um, why is it impossible to explain some, to see something with color in nature? Um, and the reason is because um, there's a strong force, which is very strong, between any two particles with different color. And so, and unlike something like the weak force get, that gets weaker as you get farther away, the strong force actually, it's, it gets harder and harder to separate particles more and more. The force gets larger, pulling them back together. So if you separate a two quarks by any more than the smallest part, you know, portion that you can't see, there's only a nearly infinite force pulling them back together to be a red-anti-red combination or a red-green-blue combination where they're stable. Um, so in nature, if you, you know, uh, form, say, a quark, it instantaneously, because it's so far away from all the other quarks, it has a very high energy and instantaneously produces the other quarks it needs to form a colorless set. So, a uh, little tricky, they're impossible to see. Um, and, and really, this is a mathematical construct that explains why all these particles exist, uh, have the right characteristics. So there is something called color, but we never observe it, right? It makes all the math uh, and all the physics kind of work out. Leptons, on the other hand, uh, don't have color. And things that don't have color don't participate in strong interactions. So leptons participate in the weak interactions, in the electromagnetic interactions, in gravity, not the strong force. So the leptons, you know, if there's the electron, uh, muon, and tau, um, they're all negatively charged. Their antiparticles are all positively charged. And then there's the neutrinos. There's an electron, there are three generations of neutrinos, an electron neutrino, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. And then there are anti neutrinos, which we'll talk about in a second. That's an interesting story. Let's uh, look for a second at this interaction here. This is how a muon <coughs> decays, because it's heavy and not a stable particle, into an electron. Right? And let's talk about the conservation here. So the muon, it's a weak force interaction. Um, it, and uh, so that it has to use this W boson, that weak force mediator here, right? And the W boson uh, produces a muon neutrino, an electron antineutrino, and an electron. Charge is conserved. I started with a minus uh, one charge here, and I ended up with minus one charge from this electron. These two aren't charged. The number of muons is conserved. I started with one muon, and I ended up with one muon neutrino, which has muon number one. The electron number is also conserved in the lepton number. This has electron number plus one. This has electron number minus one. All three of those quantities are conserved, and uh, thus this interaction can occur, and it does occur. It's a weak force interaction, and the weak force, like I said, is relatively weak, which means that this doesn't happen very quickly. Muons can travel a reasonable distance. Uh, a muon moving, uh, uh, let's see, you know, 99% of the speed of light can travel from the Earth's atmosphere all the way down here and, and hit us uh, before it decays into this electron. Um, so it happens slower than some strong interactions, which happen in, say, 10 to the minus 20 seconds or something like that. But what are the missing components of the standard model? They, those are the forces, those are some of the interactions that can occur, but there's a lot missing. There's no gravity. That's bad, because gravity seems to be important. Um, there are 19 numerical constants in the standard model, which you just measure, that's the value they have, and then it turns out that your theory works. But you would like to explain why all those physical constants have those values that they have, and the standard model doesn't allow you to do that. You just measure the number of, you know, some various particle. You measure the mass of this particle, and it comes out to whatever it is. Why are there three generations of particles? Why not four? Why not six? Why not one? Um, why in our universe that we see is there a bunch of matter around and there's no antimatter, right? We haven't found an anti-planet sitting out there. We've ruled out basically that anywhere in our observable universe there are anti-galaxies or anti-planets or anything like that. There is much more uh, matter than antimatter. Do you have a question? Um, and uh, there's no dark matter in this model anywhere. 
right? None of these particles that we, we talked about could be the dark matter in our universe. So we need some sort of extension. Uh, and there's a bunch of other problems, too. And now I'll point out three problems from the standard model um, that you can solve uh, with, by introducing something, and that something happens to be a dark matter candidate particle. First one I'm going to talk about is axioms. Is uh, also a cleaning product, I guess. I've never used it. <laughs> Good. Axions, uh, so, so particles have something called uh, a CP symmetry. Um, most forces that we know obey the, obey the symmetry, which says that if we reverse the charge, go from, say, an electron to a positron, which have the opposite charge, and then we switch um, the spatial dimension, i.e., we take this from a, an electron that has spin up, and then we make it in a positron that has spin down, so its angular momentum is pointing in the opposite direction. Uh, the laws of physics are invariant. Uh, one, one, one thing would be if you turned all of our universe to antimatter and uh, you flipped all of the spins of every particle in our universe, you would have another universe that functions the exact same way. And you would call one, you would switch what you call matter and antimatter probably, but you would now live in an anti universe and everything should work the same. Uh, that's C is symmetry. So the experiment. Experiments show that the strong force and the electromagnetic force obey CP symmetry always, as far as we can tell. The weak force does not, actually. There's a weak force process that violates CP symmetry. That's important because in the early universe, you need to violate charge parity symmetry in some way to explain why you get more electrons out of the beginning of the universe than you get positrons. You have to explain why you get more matter than antimatter. Uh, and you can do that with the weak force in the early universe. And, uh, and produce the, the asymmetry. This got James Cronin, who's here at the University of Chicago, the Nobel Prize in 1980. Now there's a strong CP problem. Like I said, experiments say that the strong force obeys CP symmetry to one part in uh, 10 billion. But if you write down, don't worry about any of this math up here, but if you write down this force that, that tells you how the strong force is supposed to work, there's a term in the middle that does not obey CP symmetry. Uh, you don't need to know why or what any of that means. I don't actually really know what all that means. Anyway, so, but, but, but what it does mean is, experimentally, the strong force obeys CP symmetry. Theory-wise, the strong force has no reason to obey CP symmetry. And remember what I said earlier, any physics interaction that can happen, like this one here, moderated by this term that doesn't obey CP symmetry, should happen at some point. And so we need a reason to explain why this CP violation doesn't occur. Uh, we need some reason to explain why this value is approximately zero in our model. Um, and we have one free parameter here. It's called this theta. And maybe if theta is zero, then this whole term is zero, and then you don't have any CP symmetry. But theta is just one of these arbitrary 19 constants that we got to choose in our standard model. Why is it really, 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 really small when it could be any? This is what's called a fine-tuning problem in physics. I have some free parameter. It could choose any value. For the universe to work the way it does, it has to choose a very particular weird value. And I don't like that as a theorist, right? I want to I wanna either explain why things have really particular weird values, or I want it to be physics works about the same regardless of what value it chose, and so it chose a random one. You know, those would be OK, but that's not the situation we're in. So it was, it was posited uh, by uh, Petschy and Quinn that there was a particle called an axion. Um, and what axions do is they're, they're very light particles in, in, in the universe. And they give you a minus term that almost exactly cancels out this positive term. In fact, uh, the, the early universe drives the axion term to exactly cancel out that theta term. You get an extra term here in this, in this uh, Lagrangian. Uh, which cancels out this term here, and everything is zero, and uh, you're happy. Um, and it turns out that when you, uh, you cancel this asymmetry, the axion gets a little bit of mass. It's, it, it starts as a massless particle, and by canceling the asymmetry, this would be mass zero here at the center of this thing. It floats over to here, where it has a mass uh, defined by this distance, here on this plot. Okay, so theta is zero. CP, uh, the strong force appears to obey CP symmetry like it should. And now I have a particle called an axion that needs to exist, and that particle has some mass. Great. The axions then naturally become very cold. 
Um, remember, the axion, like I said, that, that gets created in this process is really light, uh, much less than an electron volt. And that was actually the reason we talked about last week why neutrinos couldn't be the dark matter. They're very light, so when they're created, they're created with a bunch of energy, they're hot, and they can't fall in the in the core. In the, but axions can actually uh, cool um, in the early universe. Basically, as they fall, let me go back. As they fall into this well, they start rocking around, and there is friction in here, and that friction cools them, and they become a cold particle. Um, remember, uh, going back all the way to the first uh, first lecture, there were there were two types of radiation. There were two types of processes. One was like a thermal process that happens, like fire has a given energy and heat, and then there's something that's non-thermal, like your iPhone sending off radio signals. So axions are produced with a non-thermal process. They have this dynamic cooling mechanism that makes them cold. So it doesn't matter if they were light and they were produced when the universe was very hot, because they're not produced by a hot thermal process. They're produced via a dynamical process, uh, which keeps the electrons, or keeps the axions cold. Axions, then, are a great dark matter thing. Uh, they don't interact with light very commonly. Uh, they have a very rare interaction with light, I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, they're stable, uh, entirely stable, because they're a very light particle. They're the lightest particle, so they can't decay into anything. Um, and they're, they're cold. Uh, they're driven to low velocities by this dynamic friction in the early universe. So they have the three properties we want. Uh, they, they are created not to solve a dark matter problem, they're created to solve this strong CP problem, and they happen to give us all the dark matter characteristics we want. <coughs> How do we detect an axion? For an axion to exist with that field and cool correctly, it has to interact with the photon uh, very rarely. Um, and what you can get is an axion can here produce two uh, very low energy photons, like this. Um, and to get this interaction to work, you have to have another photon to carry. Uh, Let's see if I can explain this correctly. Axion is moving in some direction. It produces two photons. They have to be moving in opposite directions. You can't conserve momentum because the photon momentums are going to cancel. And the axion had an initial momentum. So you can't conserve momentum unless you have more photons here to carry away that extra momentum. To make more photons, in order to detect these things, make a really big magnetic field. And a magnetic field has a bunch of virtual photons in it because photons carry the electromagnetic interaction. So you have a, a very cold uh, cavity chamber uh, called this ADMX experiment, axion dark matter experiment. So this is super cooled to a few Kelvin. They put a large magnetic field in it, like an MRI machine, which produces lots of virtual photons. They wait for an axion to come through this machine. There's a bunch of axions in our universe that should come in. When the axion is in this machine, it produces two gamma rays, and we look for those gamma rays. Um, what's interesting is that the, the machine has to have a magnetic field that uh, exactly is at the mass of the axion particle, so that this, uh, this conversion works. So you take the, the magnetic, or, sorry, not the, uh, the magnetic field, the, uh, the microwave, the size of that cavity has to be exactly proportional to the axion mass. Uh, so you just take it and you tune your cavity over time and you go through all the different axion masses one by one and over time you rule them out. Uh, the current results of this theory are, are shown here. This is the mass of the axion particle. Notice these are all small, right? Uh, the, uh, this is 10 eV. The electron is up here at 10 to the 5 eV. So that the electron is here and the proton is way up here. The axion is way down here. Um, and maybe it's 10 orders of magnitude smaller than that still, the mass of the, mass of the axion. Um, and this is the coupling between axion particles and photons. For axion to be the dark matter, it has to be on this yellow curve here. This is what ADMX is ruling out right now. And actually, they have a new advanced version of ADMX that will get this whole yellow band um, in this range here. And there are a bunch of other limits here. So ADMX in the next few years is going to tell us about a large portion of the axion parameter space, and then there's also other experiments looking at different ranges. Um, there was a report uh, some of you might have seen about two weeks ago in the news about whether we detected axion dark matter looking at the sun. This is another way to, to look um, for dark matter. So, so I had axions come from the sun because uh, they're produced in some particle interaction. They flow out, 
they hit the Earth's magnetic field, and the magnetic field, you know, the Earth has a lot of magnetic field, and they have to travel for a large way, so they do that same conversion from before. The axions produce two gamma rays in the Earth's magnetic field. So I have my X-ray telescope on Earth look for these X-rays and see if there are more than I would have expected when I look through the Earth's magnetic field and when I don't look through the Earth's magnetic field. There's a slight hint right now that this might be true. Um, it came out two weeks ago, and I don't think uh, people are ready to say anything much uh, yet. And it's also, the effect is maybe, you know, there's about a 5% chance it was a random statistical anomaly or something like that. So uh, it remains to be seen. But that's interesting. Okay, so I have the axions. Uh, now let's talk about a sterile neutrino, which is a heavier cousin of the neutrinos that were very light that we had in our, in our original particle. So what do we know about the neutrinos? They're a pretty mysterious particle. Um, it's a known standard model particle. It doesn't interact with the electromagnetic force. Uh, but neutrinos do interact via that weak force process, which is weaker. Um, they were proposed in 1930 and discovered in 1956. And the reason is, uh, that's a bad example interaction. From that muon decay before, you know, I would have seen uh, the muon decay to an electron, and the energy wouldn't have looked like it was conserved. Right? Because I didn't know about the neutrinos, I didn't know about those two other things that were carrying away energy in that earlier process. Um, so the neutrino was proposed to solve that energy conservation problem. They said, I bet physics actually does conserve energy, and that just means there's another particle that carries away energy that we don't know about. That's why the neutrino was proposed, and it turns out that was right. There are two interesting facts about neutrinos. All neutrinos are left-handed, um, and their antiparticles are all right. -handed. And by left-handed, what I mean is that when a neutrino is going in this direction, the spin of the neutrino is going in this direction. It's not going in the other direction. So this is a left-handed process, and that's right-handed, I think. Uh, those might be backwards. It depends on whether I'm using my right hand or my left hand. Uh, and I always get confused. It's called a right-hand rule when you do uh, uh, vector multiplication. And one time when, when I was a freshman in physics, I was writing the test out with my right hand, so I used my left hand the whole time, and I got every answer off by a negative sign. <laughs> okay, other weird thing is that neutrino masses are six orders of magnitude smaller than the mass of any other standard model particle. Why, why a huge gap between all, this, all the standard model particles and the neutrino? Okay, so why are there no right-handed neutrinos? Um, every other standard model particle has left-handed and right-handed um, except for the neutrino. And we, we observe all, all neutrinos to be left-handed or anti-neutrinos to be right-handed. Two ideas. One is that neutrinos are what we call Majorana particles, where they are their own anti-particle. And then the neutrino is the anti-neutrino, and there's a right and left-handed version, one of which we've been calling an anti-particle and one of which we've been calling a particle. Uh, but that was just our choice of words. And the second is that there are some right-handed neutrinos, but they're really heavy. Um, so are neutrinos their own particle, antiparticle? Well, they're not charged. Um, so their antiparticle have the same charge, which is zero, as their particle. So if neutrinos uh, follow what's called the Majorana equation, um, or what we call the Majorana mass, then they, they can be their own antiparticle. And, and the only thing that would switch is whether they're right-handed or left-handed, like I said. So the spin flips from right-handed to left-handed, and we know that's true of the neutrinos we observe. The mass is the same of the neutrino and anti-neutrino, we think, and they're not charged, so that doesn't have to flow. So that's a reasonable uh, guess, and there are experiments that are searching for several interactions that can only occur if a neutrino is, is its own anti uh, antiparticle. I read about uh, Majorana last night while preparing this lecture, uh, who uh, proposed the idea of, uh, of Majorana particles that are their own antiparticles. Uh, Tragically, he disappeared in 1938, uh, took out all his money out of a bank, took a, uh, a boat from uh, Alorma to Naples, and was never heard from again. Uh, so, uh, but uh, he did propose this first, and there, there are awards after him, uh, and that sort of thing. The uh, idea that a, a heavier right-handed neutrino might exist um, was provoked by what's called the seesaw mechanism. So that is, why are these neutrinos all really light? So here are the electron, up and down quarks, bottom top quarks. They all exhibit, they're all in this range, which is all pretty close. And the neutrinos are way down here. 
So the seesaw mechanism says you can make something really light if you have it interact with something really heavy. And that heavy thing might be the right-handed neutrinos. And then that would make the, the, uh, the left-handed neutrinos that we do see very light. So it's the opposite of this. We know, uh, let's see, we know this side of the equation, that this part is really light. These are the neutrinos we know. So maybe that means there's a heavier thing that's pushing it uh, high on this uh, uh, seesaw. Unfortunately, this doesn't actually let us measure what the mass is of that uh, neutrino. It could be uh, the way that these, these equations work, and I'm not going to go through them. You could have a very light neutrino and have the very, very heavy sterile neutrino be almost on the, your, your like Planck scale where grand unification theory happens, you know, 20 orders of magnitude above what we can see in particles over 15 orders of magnitude or something like that. Uh, and then you will have a hard time ever, ever seeing this particle, and it won't really have much of a role how physics works today. Um, but maybe you have a, uh, a light neutrino, and this actually just pushes a, a heavy neutrino up to some energy that we can't detect, like KEV or something like that. Um, and at the KEV scale, this can actually be responsible for the dark matter. Uh, it can be responsible for something called uh, pulsar kicks, which I'm not going to talk about. So the properties of the sterile neutrino. It's dark because it doesn't interact except through mixing with the normal neutrino. And that happens very rarely. It's a weak force process, so it's a dark particle. Uh, on cold, it can actually be warmish. Um, so um, remember how cold, this is a thermally produced particle. So it depends on what the mass of the particle is compared to when it became decoupled from the beginning of our universe. And a, uh, if, if a neutrino has a mass of a few keV, it's not entirely cold, and it's moving a little bit faster. Um, structure can still form, but it forms a little bit differently. And so people can look for how structure formation works in our universe and maybe tell how cold the dark matter was, or maybe it's a little bit warm, which can point to this sort of mechanism. And it's stable. Um, it only decays in other neutrinos. Again, that's weak force, and that happens very rarely. Uh, so how do, we, how do we detect this? Well, if the mass of the sterile neutrino is really heavy, it's almost undetectable always. Um, if the neutrino mass is above the weak, uh, sorry, otherwise, the neutrino can mix like this. So we come in with a really heavy neutrino starting off here. This is our sterile neutrino. It decays and it produces a gamma ray to carry away the energy, and it produces this lighter neutrino, the ones that we observe. Right. So this starts with uh, this starts left-handed. This is right-handed, but uh, and so that's a difference of, of two in terms of the spin. Uh, well, actually, this is uh, one half. This is minus one half, so it's a difference of one. And photons have to have spin one which they do, and so it can carry away that, that difference in spin, angular momentum. Great. So that's a decay mechanism that works. It doesn't happen very often, but I can look for this, for this gamma ray. Notice this has some mass. This has some mass. And so the amount of energy difference between this and this is always the same. This means this gamma ray is always going to have exactly the same amount of energy. Uh, so we can look for, for uh, gamma ray. I, I, gamma ray, x-ray, something like that with exactly the right amount of energy equal to the neutrino mass. Um, here's a plot of current constraints. Again, there's a whole mess of stuff here. Uh, this is uh, the mass of our neutrino particle. It can go all the way. Remember, this is almost entirely unconstrained. That seesaw mechanism doesn't actually tell me what the mass of this thing is at all. So all the way down for, to here from uh, 10 to the 3 times less massive than the electron up to 10 to the, uh, you know, whatever, nine times as massive as the electron. Um, and then this is how much this neutrino interacts with the, the normal neutrinos that we see. And a lot of this area is ruled out by these color things, and some of the areas are still good. Um, and we would like to rule them out. Um, in uh, February of this year, there's a paper out by uh, Ezra Bogol, uh, some collaborators at uh, Harvard where they were looking for x-ray lines. I said the neutrino should be about a keV, which means that the x-rays that we see coming off of that process should be about the neutrino mass at a few keV. Um, they were looking at large galaxy clusters. Those are, remember, have a lot of dark matter in them, so they should be really bright in anything that produces uh, photons from dark matter. Um, and they looked at all these galaxy clusters, they stacked them all together, and they found this small line. Uh, Ezra was actually around yesterday uh, to give a talk on this at uh, Chicago. So I will show you the line. Uh, can anyone point to me where the line is? 
Here, here it all is. We're looking for a pump here. Uh, I, I will help you. By oh, there's the line. I made it all red. And so now you can see it. It's a bump right there at 3.57 keV. It's uh, statistically significant, actually, um, at like four sigma or something like that. And uh, there's there's a nice test I, I enjoy called uh, um, the, the Weiner method after after Neil Weiner. Whoops. Oh, this is not this is going to ruin my, my effect here. Let me let me do this differently. I don't know why I decided to do that. Uh, the Neil Weiner method is if you turn the plot upside down and you can still see a bump, then you're then you were imagining it. <laughs> so so here, look, there's no bump anymore. I turned it upside down. I looked there, so it looks like it might actually be a real thing. Um, this is currently under investigation. Uh, several different X-ray satellites now have seen this uh, in several different regions, which is pretty exciting. A couple of satellites have not seen it, looking at things where they should have seen these dark matter uh, decays, um, and those are in tension with each other strongly, and so it remains to be uncovered. It was only first observed in February, so it uh, uh, will be new. Anyway, really exciting. The last thing I'm going to talk about is weakly interacting massive particles. Um, this is our last extension of our standard model might explain a dark matter particle. So this is motivated by supersymmetry. And supersymmetry says, uh, it basically is a um, correspondence between the fermions and bosons that we have in our standard model, model and superpartners that are heavier, um, that heavier particles that have all the same quantum numbers except uh, their spins. Um, so there's some hypothetical particles. So for every you know particle over here, there's a super particle up here that has is corresponding to this one. Great. We give these super particles funny names, um, which you do like this. If it's a quark or a lepton, you take the normal particle name and you add an s at the beginning of the name. So quarks become squarks, leptons become sleptons, neutrinos become neutrinos, tau leptons become tau leptons. Tops become stops, and et cetera, et cetera. For force carriers, they decided they needed to do something different. Uh, so instead, you add an eno at the end. So the Higgs particle becomes a Higgs eno. Uh, the W particle becomes a W eno. The gravi gravity particle, like a graviton, if it exists, becomes a gravitino. And the, yeah. Um, then we didn't do that for the W and Z, uh, or for the Z particle. We didn't call it a Z eno. Since that one's neutral, we call it a neutral eno. I don't know why. Uh, another funny story. The first time I was ever giving a talk, I was I was I was talking about uh, uh, dark matter that decays uh, into uh, W eno dark matter and decays into W bosons. And I spent the entire talk in front of uh, twenty professors calling this a wino. <laughs> <laughs> I was corrected by someone in the back corner afterwards. <laughs> okay. So supersymmetry has this correspondence for every particle that we know up here. These no particles we're used to interacting with. There's a supersymmetric, heavier shadow particle lurking beneath the surface. And why do we want that? Um, so supersymmetry is the best solution to what's called a hierarchy problem, which is generally, why is gravity so much weaker than every other force that we know in nature? Um, and uh, it, that's correlated to the question of why is the Higgs boson particle measured, like we just found it at 126 GeV, and why is it not 10 to the 20 GeV? which is what theory might expect. Uh, the reason you would expect the Higgs particle to be really heavy is that uh, you define the Higgs mass basically by all of these loops that it can make. Um, and it, this is a tricky thing. So I start with a Higgs, I have this loop of top particles, and then I have a Higgs coming out. And then basically this kind of slows down the Higgs particle and makes it look like it has a mass. That's how the Higgs mechanism works. If you calculate the coupling to this, it's infinite, which means that the Higgs mass should be infinitely large. So I need a negative, so the same way I did this thing with the axions, uh, where I had a new term come in and it canceled out the old term. If I have a super particle term, uh, say from stops, uh, uh, which is this uh, super symmetric particle at the tops, it cancels this term, exactly. Um, so all of those things that force the Higgs particle to go towards infinity mass start getting canceled out, and I get a Higgs mass that's a reasonable number. Um, and now I've observed the Higgs mass to be a, a reasonable number, so I think there must be some super partner that, that's helping this cancellation happen. I also think that stop is a particularly great term now for this particle, because it stops the Higgs mass from going off crazy. 
Good. So why would a supersymmetry give us a candidate for dark matter? Well, the lightest supersymmetric particle sh should be stable, or, or very well could be stable at least. Which means that um, there I have all I have all of these particles, right? The heavy ones decay into light ones, heavy ones decay into light ones, whatever. Over here, the heavy things decay into light things, but whatever's lightest over here, and I don't know what that is, uh, should just sit around forever. And let's say that this is one of these uh, neutral particles over here. Uh, let's just pretend. Um, then that it's stable, and it could be heavy and not have a charge, and all those things we want. That would make it dark matter. And this is tied to another question that I haven't answered yet, but it's pretty important. Why five times as much dark matter as normal matter in our universe? Remember, we made that, that I should have shown here, that pie chart before, right? It's about 4% normal matter that we can see, about 20% dark matter, and about 70% dark energy. Those don't add up to one, but there were a bunch of flux factors involved. OK, um, so why is it five? Why is it not one million times as much dark matter, or whatever that large number is, or one ten billionth times as much dark matter? as regular matter, why are they so reasonable? This suggests that in the early universe there was some interaction that forced these things to be about the same, right? Um, so you can think of it here, right? If I, if I had started my early universe here and I had some interaction, let's say every time I had two uh, dark matter particles, which uh, I'll say are red balls, crash into each other and they make two blue balls, and every time I have two blue marbles crash into each other, they make a red particle. So my dark matter is going into normal matter, and my normal matter is going back into dark matter. So anything that I start with in the universe, if I start with only uh, you know, blue marbles, some of them will crash into each other and they'll form some red marbles, right? Where there aren't many red marbles, so they won't crash into each other that often. They won't find each other. Um, and so that means that if I start from any condition where I start, say, with a million times as much dark matter as, as normal matter, then my, my dark matter particles will crash much more often and make normal matter in the early universe. The normal matter won't make so much dark matter. Now come out with about the same amount, right? So this, this, this physics here drives you to something where you have about an equal number of red marbles and blue marbles, and that doesn't depend on what you started with. So it's not like we had to fine tune, we remember that word. We didn't have to pick that these had to be the same in the early universe. This dynamics here drives you to these two values being about the same. Um, and this can be done uh, with weak interactions. Um, so the weak force, like I said, in dark matter can inter interact with because it's very weak, so you don't see it that often in the early universe. But it can interact with gluons and photons. So how does the weak force uh, work? Like I said, the weak force is really weak today, right? And the reason that the weak force is weak is because this Z boson and W boson that carry the weak force are very heavy. This one is 91 GeV. Uh, the W bosons are 80 GeV. Um, the photon, like on the other hand, is massless, right? So you can imagine it like, uh, you know, every time that a particle wants to talk to another particle and say, I'm here and we should have a weak force interaction, it has to hurl this really heavy W or Z boson and push it towards that other particle, right? That takes a lot of energy. Most particles don't have a lot of energy today because they're cold. Um, so these interactions happen very, very rarely. That's a, that's a nice kind of a picture of what's going on. So it's like uh, if you had some, some particle that's very cold or very, very low energy in the universe, like this small child, um, if he had to throw a bowling ball to his friend every time he wanted to throw a pitch, it wouldn't happen very often. Um, on the other hand, in the early universe, there's a lot of energy, right? Now, in the early universe, maybe all the particles are dancing around, and they're all a million GeV apiece. Well, then throwing a, a 91 GeV particle back and forth is like nothing. It's like having this really strong football player throw the same bowling ball, right? That can happen very easily in the early universe. And it turns out that in the early universe, the weak force is just as strong as the electromagnetic force. Right? As long as the energy of particles in the universe is much heavier than the mass of these two particles. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is known as something called electroweak unification, which says that if you go to a reasonably high energy, the weak force and, and electromagnetic force actually become the same. There's something called a WIMP mirror. And this is something unique to WIMPs that isn't true of the sterile neutrinos or the axions we talked about earlier. So you take a, you make a new supersymmetric particle, or you make any stable particle actually, and you give it a weak interaction cross section. So it's throwing those W and Z bowling balls, 
and you give it a mass that's about the same as the W and Z particles, so about 100 GeV. And then you ask, what does dynamics force you into in the early universe? And the answer is that the dynamics, oh, the dynamics tell you, the dynamics naturally give you out a particle that has about the same energy density as is actually observed. So it's, a, it's kind of a miracle, right? I take these known forces, weak forces, and I ask how much of this particle should exist today, and it turns out it's about 20% of the total energy density of our universe. Um, and that, that doesn't have to be true, right? It could, it could have floated any number. It floats to exactly the number that is the dark matter that we actually observe. And this is why WIMPs are considered the best candidates for dark matter. So for none of the other methods, axions might very well exist, sterile neutrinos might exist. But nothing tells me that they have to be the same energy density as the dark matter that I actually observe, this 21%. For WIMPs, if supersymmetry is true, and there is this stable particle, the dynamics of the universe naturally forces me to a dark matter that is 20% of the energy density of the universe, just like I observed. So what would I look for for looking for this sort of particle? Um, so it's going to have a mass about the weak force mass, about those W and Z bosons, and if you want to get really broad, maybe it's from 10 GeV up to 10,000 GeV or something like that. And it's going to interact via the weak force, which nowadays is very weak, used to be very strong. Um, and, uh, but that's some interaction that I can at least look for. Um, and this, I'm not going to talk about the current uh, status of these observations. I'm going to make this the topic of the next four lectures. Um, and uh, the reason I'm going to make this the topic of the next four lectures is that there are two. Um, one is I think that this is what most people work on for the exciting uh, reason that this gives you the right mass density for dark matter in our universe, which makes it the most exciting candidate. And uh, more importantly, this is what I work on. Um, so I'm going to talk about stuff that I do. <laughs> Good. Uh, lastly, maybe maybe dark matter is something else. So I probed three things that I think are the most well-motivated extensions of the standard model. They're the, they're the things that should probably exist in the standard model anyway to solve particle physics problems we have with how quantum field theory works. Um, and then they also naturally give us a dark matter candidate. But there's other things that, that could also exist. There are these champed, uh, champ particles that are really, really heavy. They have some charge, but their charge is very low, so they don't interact with like much. There are super wimps, but they're wimps, but they interact with something even weaker than the weak force. Wimpzillas, which are really, really heavy wimps of way above 10,000 GeV. Um, and there's a, there's a story by a, it's, it's a Redmond's theorem, which says that uh, any competent theorist can fit any theory to any set of facts. <laughs> I think he must have been like an experimentalist or something. I don't actually know. Um, but at the end of the day, like, we have observations. If you want to make a theory that's good, it has to predict something, and that something has to be true. So we have observations over the judge and jury for these extensions of the standard model that we produce. And so we're going to chase all of these particles at the same time. And I'm going to chase weights, because that's what I do. So uh, just to conclude, um, there are no standard model particles that have the properties that are needed to be the dark matter particle. But there are several extensions that are simple of the standard model and they produce these particles that could be the dark matter, that have all the correct properties. Um, in each case, the reason that you invented that new particle was not to make a dark matter particle. It was to solve some other particle or problem with the standard model that you know exists. Uh, there isn't a, this wasn't an exhaustive list, um, but these three are interesting, and, and that's why we look for them. So I will conclude there. Thanks. ago, uh, standard model particles were just this uh, kind of square array, 4 by 4 right? Yeah. Uh, uh, now we have the Higgs attached on. Mm -hmm. And uh, also you indicated that supersymmetric particles would uh, be in a whole separate array like this. Uh, yeah. Uh, what other, how would other particles uh, be presented in, in this uh, method of presentation, and what else can we expect? Uh, more separate arrays or more particles uh, on the side? Or yeah, yeah. so for supersymmetry, I would think of uh, yeah, a, a second dimension that goes like this. Okay. Where there's a second supersymmetric set below the particles that are standard model particles that we already know. Um, 
let's see here. Um, the sterile neutrino would come up as a, as a new generation. You, you would expand this by three. Uh, these electrons, there would be three more here. And they, would, and they would be the sterile neutrinos that correspond to these three neutrinos. Um, and uh, for axions, I don't, I don't know where you put them on this diagram. They're somewhere over there. It probably depends on what their, uh, their spin is. I, I, it depends on their spin, I don't remember what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Could you go back to the 3.57 KEV X-ray? Yep. Maybe. Please. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. The, the lower sets of graphs. Yeah. The, the blue squiggle, if you want, of all those points. Yeah, yeah. With, with the large deviations involved, what are those? Yeah, so I didn't, I just kind of realized this, I didn't explain it well. But, so um, this is, um, these are observations by what's called the XMM Newton satellite, uh, which is an X-ray satellite uh, run by the European Space Agency. Um, and uh, they're looking for X-rays that have energies between, I think, 2 keV, uh, so that's 2,000 times the normal kind of light energy that we're seeing from lights right now, up to about 8,000 uh, 8, times that, so 8 keV, 2 to 8 keV. Um, and they looked at clusters of galaxies, which are dense regions with lots of dark matter in them. Um, and they looked at how many uh, x-rays they got at every single energy. Uh, this is how many x-rays they recorded at every single energy. And it looks like this thing. So these are all these little things up here. Uh, you know, with air bars on them at every energy. Um, this is, that solid line up here is then the model for how many x-rays they expected at every energy. And that is okay, become, a theoretical line. The, the black line is theoretical, the, the little points that are data. Okay. Um, and the, the black line is a combination of a couple things. You have hot gas in clusters. Hot gas is, is really hot, it produces from thermal processes, it produces x-rays. So the gas could be, you know, uh, 10 million degrees or something like that, and that produces x-rays. Um, so you have that. And then on top of that, you have atomic transition lines. So these are the things like a uh, uh, photon comes in, um, and it excites an electron, and then it, that electron moves back into the lower state, um, and that produces a, a photon. We talked about that at the beginning. Um, so that's what actually what all these, uh, these little bumps are here. So the, 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 the part from the thermal is really smooth. These bumps correspond to different known atomic transition lines. Um, um, then this middle plot here is uh, data minus the specific black line. And so these are all the residuals. This is how much the, the theory is infinning the data. So if looking like it's pretty good, maybe there's a little error there. And the big error is right here. You have a lot of points in a row that are all bigger than you theoretically predicted. Um, and so that's that's where they find an excess. Correct. Yeah. C correct me if I'm completely off base, but if you were to take a look at the standard deviation of that band. Uh, this black band, yes. Well, or, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then look at your bump. It doesn't seem that it ex exceeds the standard deviation. Um, can you please explain that? We'll so there was a 15 minute fight about this yesterday. So that's <laughs> One of the questions is, what is the theoretical uncertainty in this black theory band? Right? Is if that if this black band is actually really large, then none of this looks like anything. Um, after the 15 minute fight, I don't know the answer to that. I, uh, I think there are two. I think there are two things worth pointing out. The theory band does really well everywhere else. And actually, not just over here. Uh, this observation goes all the way over here on the plot, and it goes way over here. Okay. Um, so there, there's a lot of extra area they just zoomed in. Um, so everywhere else, the theory is doing really well, um, except in this one energy. So if you're only doing a correlated one energy where it looks like a bomb, um, oh, one, one thing that I haven't said, so uh, you're probably not aware. Um, the energy resolution of this instrument is, uh, is only uh, something like 10%, or, or like maybe 300 E, 300 EV here. Which means that when a, when a photon comes in at 3.57 keV, where this bump is, 
it might be mismeasured over here at like 3.5 kV, or it might be measured at like 3.65 kV. Okay. The instrument doesn't know. So this thing is broad. It would be a per it would be a line if your instrument was perfect okay, in reconstruction so the energy. Right. But uh, yeah, it, it's smeared out like this. So there, it only looks like we're missing one line. The next question is, um, is that line just a natural physical line that we don't know about? And that's kind of the big debate nowadays. Um, so maybe this line um, on top, you can't see it here. There's, there's a potassium line over here. There's an no, argon line here, a potassium line here. There's a gold line here. Gold is important, actually, because it's in your instrument, which means gold lines get produced by instrumental things sometimes. These all produce lines that are near. Maybe one's mismeasured. Maybe we have some sort of error, and the two are mixed in a weird way. That, um, that's the debate going back and forth, and there's probably 10 papers written on that, so we we'll were discussing that. So those are all good questions. Yeah. Yeah, I get the impression, of course, that the regular neutrinos oscillate mm -hmm. between the families because there's a small mass. Yeah. And you're talking about the sterile neutrino oscillating into the regular neutrinos and having to get rid of a lot of the energy yeah, because of the mass into this X-ray? I wouldn't order. call it an oscillation anymore because it really happens one direction. The probability that a regular neutrino oscillates back into the sterile neutrino is, is zero. very small um, because you've gotten rid of the energy. Because I've gotten rid of the energy. You can't do that but anymore. But what about the oscillations of the regular neutrinos? Mm -hmm. They're yeah, so almost all of the neutrino energy is in its velocity. Neutrinos have such a small energy. So when I oscillate, like, I don't notice that difference between energies. It's That's just soaked up in very small velocity changes. Mm -hmm. So let's say, like, I, I measured a neutrino uh, as uh, one type, an electron neutrino, and then I sent it off, and I measured it again, and I set it back into its mass state, and it has now I measured it as a muon neutrino. They will have been moving at slightly different speeds. Those speed differences will be so small that I won't notice. Um, so energy gets conserved um, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why, uh, if you have excess of X-rays detected on these uh, uh, dots, why the line in the, in the top graph goes down below the uh, why does this line here? Yes. Yeah. Why is it, is so, um, so that red line is what the theoretical expectation looks like, and the blue line is a theoretical expectation with an extra bump added at 3.57. So both have theoretical. Uh, so, so what? So the theoretical prediction before they looked at the data was the blue line that turned into a red line right here, and it gives you this excess here. The blue line is after I looked at the data and I realized there was an excess, I added in an extra bump. That I, I, added, an ex, I added in an extra line here. I don't know why that exists, but I added it in to fit the data. And that makes everything fit better, is what they're showing, because these blue points that are down here fit the data a lot better. So the idea is um, I found an excess, and I want to find out what the excess looks like. So I add in a bump that looks like the excess and make sure that these residuals go away. Now, now I think it fits well. Okay. Except I have something in my theory, I don't know what it is. I see. Uh, years ago, we uh, hear the lecture on the construction of the Chandra yeah. Observatory. The one that is observing this is not the Chandra. So Chandra has also seen this, but that's not this one. No, and how is the construction of that similar to Chandra? The mirrors of this? Um, yeah. Oh. That's a tough question. Um, so, okay, this, this is XMM Newton, which is a European satellite. As soon as they found it in XMM Newton, they were worried, well, maybe it's something in the instrument that's just making more photons of that energy. So uh, the next thing they did, uh, this is XMN MOS uh, here. Uh, they used another instrument that's also on XMM that I don't remember the name of and checked with that instrument. Then they checked with Chandra. They found the same thing. Um, the, the reason that they use XMM is because XMM is a bigger satellite. It, it gets more photons. It, it gets more x-rays. So Chandra is just smaller. Chandra has a better angular resolution than XMM, which means that when you see an x-ray come in, you know what direction it came from with Chandra much better than you do with XMM. 
Uh, but here we're looking at really big objects like clusters. We don't really care about the angular resolution as much. So the fact that XMMM just gets more photons uh, means that it's found the signal uh, with higher statistical significance than Chandra has so far. But um, they've now seen the same thing uh, in XMM. Chandra, then just last, uh, just yesterday, as we're told us that they found the same signal in, uh, in uh, Suzaku, which is a Japanese X-ray satellite, just this week. Uh, so it was, Chicago was the first place she announced that yesterday. So, so was that, you mentioned the statistical significance you had, is that because they looked at those other instruments or for some other reason? Um, this one, I think, is this is four sigma by itself. Um, the, the probability that all these red lines are statistical fluctuations that are all high in a row like that is about one chance in 10,000 or something like that. Then um, they went back and they looked. So with Chandra, they haven't. This is a stacked population, so they looked at um, I think about 80 different galaxy clusters. They took all of the photons from all of them. They put them on top of each other. You know, basically, they looked at the joint significance of all of them um, and found it here. In Chandra, I think they've only detected it in the brightest cluster, uh, which is Perseus. Um, one thing that's actually cool, um, so you worry about maybe this is an instrumental problem, which is uh, a good thing to be worried about. Um, when you're looking at different clusters, remember, clusters are all far away. They're all at different red shifts. Um, which means that when the if, if you have uh, a sterile neutrino and it's emitting 3.57 keV photons, those photons get redshifted. When they get to our detector here, they're not 3.57 keV anymore. So what? So in order to do this measurement, you have to know the redshift of all those clusters, and you have to take each cluster and you have to shift its energy back to what its emitted energy was by de-redshifting it, right? So like a um, so a photon from a cluster that's, say, Z.3, well, if it emitted a 3.57 keV, that energy will actually be about 3.2 keV and we over here. And so you only get this extra significance, you find this bump, only when you appropriately de-redshift every cluster to its known redshift and then stack them on top of each other. So that's a powerful tool because it gets rid of these instrumental uncertainties. If it was an instrumental problem where it was only recording 3.57 keV photons, then I would try to redshift everything for the appropriate cluster and the lines would get smeared out all over the place for every different cluster. Um, so that's one of the, the key indications that this is not an instrumental thing and that it's something that is actually coming from the clusters. Doesn't mean it's dark matter. It could be in, you know, any astrophysics that actually happens at that cluster and produces 3.57 keV lines. We'll all de redshift the same way. Um, it's dark matter, but it, it, it is an indication that it's not instrumental. It's a nice technique in that way. Yeah. As a result of your work and other recent work, is the number of uh, supersymmetry advocates dropping slowly or quickly? <laughs> is the number of supersymmetry advocates dropping slowly or quickly? I don't think it's changing. Um, well, what, which work would that be that you're referring to? Your work. Oh, I, my, my particles are, uh, are based in supersymmetry. Uh, so I'll talk about a, a dark matter particle that I work on, um, or dark matter model that excess that appears to be dark matter-ish. Um, that would be the entire last lecture. Because um, why not talk about your own stuff? Um, <coughs> but um, the thing that's uh, challenging for supersymmetry is that you might have expected to have observed it at the LHC already. Uh, let's go this right here. Like I said before, um, you want to have the Higgs mass be something that you can observe. Well, what you did observe was like 125 GeV or something like that. Um, and you, you set the Higgs mass by having all these cancellations which make the, or all these interactions that make the Higgs heavier cancel out with these interactions. Well, the cancellations can only happen at energies that are higher than the, the energy, basically, of this stop particle. So if the stop particle gets really, really heavy, it can't cancel terms until the Higgs is already really, really heavy. Then it cancels the rest of the terms. Higgs still is an infinite, but it's also not 125 GeV. So the fact that we've measured the Higgs, and it has a mass, and now we know what the mass is, tells us that it gets harder and harder to make these stops really, really heavy. Um, and the LHC 
hasn't found any stops up to about a TeV, or a little more than a TeV. And that's starting to push on the parameter space. So if you, um, if you have now the LHC come back on at 14 TeV next year, and it pushes up and tells us there's no stops up to maybe 3 TeV, supersymmetry might still be right. But it has a harder and harder time explaining why the Higgs mass is 125 GeV, which is one of the reasons that you really want it. Um, for the most theoretically motivated people, they won't care. Um, supersymmetry solves a bunch of other things, makes a lot of other theories really nice, and it's, it, it's um, necessary in things like string theory and all this other stuff. Um, so they'll say, okay, so supersymmetry is really heavy. Uh, I might need something else that solves this hierarchy problem. Um, but uh, that's okay with me. I'm willing to give that up. And then supersymmetry is still fine. Um, so supersymmetry can always be a force of nature, even if it's almost impossible to see. Um, but the reason that you originally proposed it might start going away if the LHC doesn't see it in the next year or five years. Yeah. I have to confess, I have a very dim grasp of what you've been explaining in Me this too. massive mm -hmm. amount of physics you've laid out here today. But, uh, so I resort to something much more simple and basic. You made a couple of references to thermal processes, thermal radiation today. And when you did in the first lecture, um, I asked you a question that you said you would perhaps come back to. Okay. We were right. talking about, back then, you were, the distinction you made was between the, uh, the quintessential quantum event, which is the electron transition in an atom emitting photons, as distinct from the black body radiation, which was a thermal process. And I mentioned that I tried to find in the literature explanations of how black body, what processes produce. Fundamentally, it's how fast charged particles are moving and smacking into each other. And when the charged particle bounces back, uh, okay, so think about this way two particles coming in very fast, they're about to crash, right? Now they, they bounce back from the other direction. Uh, momentum has to be conserved, energy has to be conserved, and they emit energy in the form of photons You know, in that event. Um, and when you do that, that, how fast those things are, are hitting each other tells you what the energy of those photons coming out is. Right? So, so, so hotter things move faster, bounce harder, produce photons of higher energy. So are you saying then that this is the explanation for the uh, continuous spectrum in black body? Yeah, yeah, it's just how close the things get. So the, the variation in speed produces all right. these different... Uh, so like two particles, maybe they're still moving very fast, but they come in at this angle. They don't bounce as hard right, anymore, um, which means that the, the photons come out are slightly less energy. And since I can have continuous angles and, you know, energies that these things bounce in that it gives okay, me So since spectrum. the CMB is, is uh, black body radiation, yeah. uh, does that relate in any way to what you're talking about as dark matter uh, research or candidates or? Um, so the CMB. So the CMB being black body tells us that, that the photons being produced were in this kind of dense, bath of, of standard model particles that are charged and the photons are bouncing around all between them and giving us radiation. So that tells us a little bit about this early state of the universe. Um, dark matter, by the time the CMB freezes out, dark matter is produced and it's there. And it's not interacting with light <coughs> at that point. So whatever produces dark matter happens very early in the universe compared to the CMB, which is like 480,000 years later. Um, and when, when, when there's the CMB, um, let's see, the temperature is like 3,000 Kelvin, which means that the temperature is much less than an electron volt. And dark matter probably gets created when the universe is like uh, uh, 5 billion electron volts or something like that. So much over there. Um, so, uh, so it doesn't have much to do with dark matter, which is just hanging out at this point. It's, uh, dark matter is already starting to collapse into dense things uh, as the CMB is getting formed. That's why there are small fluctuations. Any other questions? Mm -hmm.
Christopher, your first slide. Which you were, uh, right at this yeah, slide. yeah. Chasm, like a large gap between spaces. I tried to pick edge once, and the yeah, edge was gone, and uh, I wanted to be cool and hit, so I picked something that's like a bigger edge. Yeah. What is this program that you use? Oh, Prezi. Uh, it's free and online. P R E Z I. P R E Z I. I think I'm not using it. Good. I saw someone give a much better presentation. Oh, but way fancier than this. I might try for you something. Um, okay. Cool. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. I will see you next week.